Thanks. You cannot hear me? I think everyone can, most of the people are able to hear me. Can please check your uh, microphone or test your uh, headphone? Okay, let me see if I can increase my volume. I think I'm 100%. Hello, can you hear me? Can you all hear me? Is it good? Or is the voice yes, now? It is, yeah. is it clear? Loud, uh, loud and clear? Loud and clear? Yeah. Okay then, thank you. So welcome to the uh, cloud computing program, uh, which is, uh, I think you are very much excited to learn about the uh, AWS of cloud computing or cloud computing with, with uh, AWS. Okay. Uh, AWS, we are going to have, uh, this uh, program is designed for uh, associates on AWS solutions architect, architecting on AWS, okay. uh, where you design and uh, services, Okay, that could be uh, your internet uh, bandwidth issue, I think. So I think I might have someone was asking about uh, the connectivity issues. Okay, uh, let's uh, get started. So, this is something about myself. Uh, myself is Sajid. I have uh, more than 15 years of IT experience uh, where uh, I work with. Uh, Fortune 500 companies like HP, Mobile, and then uh, gaming companies with Europe and HP and like this US. And currently, I'm working with the cloud stack companies. I do deliver uh, projects uh, within short time, or uh, it could be a small three months project, or it could be a six month project uh, like that, where it involves a lot of uh, migration strategies, planning, architecture relations, and building solutions. Uh, clients and then uh, sometimes it may require to do the scope of scope changes as well. All the things are involved that uh, I will do in your day to day or patients or day to day uh, management tasks in your company. Right? So, <clears throat> so what I have done in the past and currently what I am doing is like earlier I used to uh, implement and migrate production services on uh, data centers, populations and then uh, cloud technologies most part of US and UK, not in other countries, not in other places. So I'm certified uh, specialist uh, on AWS, Azure. Like in AWS, I do uh, I do deliver trainings or I do provide solutions on uh, architect, sysops, then development uh, uh, I have provided trainings on uh, various technologies as well, like Red Hat, BMW, and Microsoft. This is uh, something about myself, short description or uh, brief uh, description about myself. So let's get uh, started. Uh, introduction to Amazon Web Services. So what are the logos of the images that are made? You might be found by the software company. <coughs> do you see this, guys? Do you see this uh, uh, challenge nowadays? No excuse or no escape. So might be uh, you're uh, you're working from the past five years to ten years in your company, or uh, even uh, as an individual or as a developer, as a sysadmin, as a uh, DevOps uh, engineer, or as a backup engineer, or as a project manager, or as a CTO or a top level senior person. Not only for this type of employees or the individuals, even the companies also. Those who are there from past 30 years to the 40 years, like they were using traditional technologies earlier, but nowadays there is a time. Okay, let me check uh, what is the nice background noise. Let me see. Just a minute.
Hello? Yep. So, uh, even uh, not only the individuals or the employees or the uh, even the senior management or uh, even the official, uh, but the companies or the startup companies, the millennial companies or the enterprise companies are also seeing this uh, uh, type of uh, change. Like they're saying that they cannot say that we cannot take up the project as an individual. You cannot say that okay, I don't have the problem in this case. I'm I'm very good at to, to, uh, like uh, analytics. I'm very good at database. I'm very good at Java technologies. I'm very good at uh, system administration on Linux. Administration, but uh, this cloud company is new. I don't want to get in. I'm very happy with that. So, as individual, you cannot say though you have a lot of experience. As a company, as an organization, they cannot say to the client or even uh, to the new client or the existing client. If the existing client wants to migrate themselves to the cloud, or they want to migrate their applications to the cloud-aware and cloud-based applications. Yes, they want to do some modifications in the code, or they want to. Uh, deploy the code they want to deploy the code hello uh, how, how about my voice is it clear or still do you guys see any issues uh, while I speak can anyone let me know are you guys able to hear me Clear? How about my voice? Are you able to hear me? Please someone let me know. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. What could be the bug grown nice? I don't know from where it is coming. Uh, let us see who is disturbing us. Is there someone? Okay, let us know someone who is there. I don't know who is this. Uh, organizer, can you please mute someone who is waiting for name, web, waiting for name, web, someone. Uh, can you please mute that person? Thank you. Might be uh, the distributors from the side. Please mute uh, waiting for name web hello sir hello yep sir tell me sir yep i can hear you sir someone I, I, waiting for name can you please meet your sir yeah i am the Agne, uh, Agne, sir okay. okay okay please meet uh yeah now the clear is uh, audio is good now so we are not getting any displays now. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, let's uh, uh, continue. Good. Yeah, that's good now. That's good. Thank you. So again, I guess it's on back. So no excuses and no escape. That's the reason I'm saying, right? So even as an organization, see, they cannot say to their clients, think that say, yeah, again the same noise, please someone mute, I think earlier it was good, mute, yeah, mute yourself, organizer, I think you have to mute yourself. Organizer, please mute yourself. I don't know who is that waiting for name, but the noise is from there. That could be fan or something. This. But. Hello. Is this mute? Waiting for name. The name someone is. Please mute. Mute yourself. Except me. Please mute everyone. Please. Cap or fan? I don't know. I'm making. Yeah, that's good. That's good to get it. <clears throat> right? Do you see that as a developer? Yep. As a developer, like uh, you, you, you had experience of five years to ten years. 
uh, or, or as a Linux admin or the LGBT admin, uh, you have a lot of experience, but now the time has come for you to work on migrations or work on implementations of the cloud component. So if you are not skilled or if you are not capable to do that, if you are not capable to do that work, then a guy, a fresher or least experienced guy, a small guy, small kid can uh, take up the task and be the tough competition to you. That means you can see uh, how insecure you, you can see uh, uh, the challenges in your day to day operations on the job. Right. Now it, it has now it is a time for you to upgrade yourself as uh, as a pressure or yeah as a uh, uh, senior executive or senior engineer or even as a project manager or the CEO or the CTO or CEO wants to talk to the client or even the marketing or the sales guy wants to talk to the client. They should know the terminologies so how this pro existing project can be taken into the uh, or migrated to the cloud or a new project can be implemented on the cloud then they have to give the explanations, at least few things initially they have to uh, convince to the client. Or in the second phase, they may take up or they may involve the technical guy who has a good knowledge or the deep, deep knowledge in the cloud computing. They, he can uh, give the detailed uh, diagram or the detailed uh, architecture uh, uh, design and he can talk in, in the way that okay, these are the advantages that you get when you get into the cloud. Right? So this is what I'm trying to say that you cannot escape nowadays. You cannot say that no, please excuse me, I cannot take a deposit. No, excuse me, I don't have the skills. Then ultimately you will be going to lose the job or you will be going to lose the project. Because nowadays everyone is trying to, if it is a new project, it's going to be implemented on the cloud or it's it's going to be migrated to the cloud. So for that you should be trained and skilled and you should be ready. To take up the process as individual or as admission. That's the reason you are going to get new opportunities or new jobs or company organizations are going to create new jobs or uh, the candidates or the associates or the employees are going to get new challenges, new jobs. Right? That's what uh, I mean to say you cannot stay. So how cloud computing has evolved? So the thing is that cloud computing Though the evolution of ISP, the programmable web, virtualization, or independent trends, these are the different technologies, still they contribute to the evolution of cloud computing. See, as you see nowadays, even on the mobile, you see 4G LTE, right? 4G, at least you get 150 Mbps bandwidth speed. How uh, uh, good bandwidth you are getting, right? On mobile itself, so if you take up about your uh, workstation or the laptop or the server or your office environment, see how uh, throughput you get. So what kind of bandwidth you are getting back? Some, something like 150 Mbps, 200 Mbps, and dedicated lease lines. So this this is the evolution of the internet technologies. Earlier, uh, you used to get 3G and then 2G. Then uh, there was the dial-up and the uh, small bandwidth where you used to pay a lot of amount. Or it's itself on the uh, small bandwidth right now you are getting good bandwidth higher bandwidth high throughput at the cheapest price that's that's also making so that you can transfer files you can copy files even while you watch movies or the videos or you do the like the way we are doing the conferencing right web conferencing right where uh, we are able to see so what i'm doing i'm presenting my video I'm presenting my uh, present. I'm presenting something, and you are all like 50, 60 people are able to see the screen simultaneously. So that means something is happening. Streaming is happening in the back end. How is this possible? Earlier, did you used to get it a uh, few years ago? So how the changes? A lot of changes happen in the internet technologies. That is the way I'm presenting from the local laptop. You're all, you're also able to see in a similar fashion, right? Because you have the good internet links you have you got the uh, uh, good throughput internet speed that's the reason that, that you can say there's a evolution in the internet technologies so that you can download fastly you can upload quickly and you can get your job done easily so this is one of the uh, evolution in internet technologies and then like the way you get fiber optic dot fiber uh, satellite connected is high throughput right and then programmable web one of the uh, examples that i do is now you're working on the Google Drive, like right? Google Doc, 
or the presentation on the Excel sheet. You work from here and all of like tomorrow morning in Singapore, like you are in you say now tomorrow or the night you have to fly to Singapore and then tomorrow morning you have to present uh, you have to give the presentation. Then you know, we'll be using that uh, uh, presentation file that is PPT or uh, could be your Excel sheet or where you show fancy uh, pie charts and the graphs and all. Right? So instead of carrying, though you carry the laptop or the external drive flash disk and all, but still you hear that, okay, what if I lose my, what if I lose my rubbish, what if I lose my pen drive, what if that book gets corrupted, something. So then what you do, like general, you copy your file to the, your Google Drive or the SkyDrive or the uh, iCloud, you copy there, put there and remotely you access your file from Singapore tomorrow morning, you present it there, right? So that means you are giving it a programmable web call, you are copying your uh, file, word file or the doc file or your presentation file in Excel sheet you onto the cloud somewhere. You don't know where the file is being stored and and uh, what is the size of the bag and how it is being managed, how virtually it is stored, in which location it is stored. stored. So everything, you are not familiar about it but you are still able to access the file by giving HTTP call or the, just by using a simple browser or the app. You are able to download the file and read it or you modify it or present it. So this is the tremendous uh, evolution in the technologies of uh, te technology, technology in the programmable like HTTP calls or the HTTPS calls and REST calls. So we'll do, we'll uh, go deep dive into uh, about it later. But uh, so this is how we are seeing, right? Earlier we used to use SOAP calls, SOAP methods on HTTP. Now REST calls with JSON methods with very use, which are very lightweight and then uh, uh, being used widely uh, in the internet industry. Most of the developers they use JSON payloads, REST payloads, which are very lightweight and uh, easily understood by any technology. That you need not to transform from one format to another format. Right? So this is the tremendous technology of evolution in the program of web as internet you work and virtualization as well. So you are getting a lot of changes in virtualization. Right? Right, right. So this is one of the example I'm giving, uh, giving, uh, uh, giving for the rest. Yeah. Right. Virtualization. You might be using other, but this is the very commonly used uh, REST calls for the internet. Okay. Uh, virtualization, like where, like you see, a lot of changes in VMware. Right. VMware different different versions, and uh, not only the VMware, the Hyper-V from Microsoft, and then uh, uh, Citrix, Zen, and the KVM. A lot of changes, uh, evolutions and a lot of features from the virtualization point of view also. Where you do easily manage your virtual infrastructure, your disk, your CPUs, your RAM, virtual machines or even your apps and that too in the highly distributed environment also. Digital use environment also. As well you do the connectivity and the integrations uh, between one service to another service. All those things you are doing virtually, right? You are doing virtual, virtually you don't know from where uh, you're calling. Like you, your file is somewhere, uh, the, your disk is somewhere uh, in the data center, one data center or one location, and your server is in some other location. But you're still able to store the file or the activity file by giving some calls using the program of web calls. But how you are being accessing? What you don't know where it is. From where you are getting some part of the CPU, from where you are getting some part of RAM, and from where you are getting one of the service like message key service or the database service or the storage service or the backup service, you don't know where it is. But still you are able to use them just to uh, know what ultimately what you want is you want in the service. That's it. So if you combine all these things, all these things like virtualization, evolution in virtualization and evolution in the a uh, lot of development, uh, you can say not only programmable web, I can say developments, a lot of development uh, changes like you have seen nowadays. Uh, main stacks and the JSONs like uh, AngularJS, Node.js, Python, Ruby, right? A lot of a lot of things are happening now. You see a lot of pro simple programs where uh, these are very effective and then powerful programs, codes, which are very lightweight. The companies, uh, organizations, or even the developers are looking for the added programs. We want it to run executed. The runtime and runtime should be very short, like that, right? And a lot of changes in the services. So. This all this made the evolution in the cloud computing because you get your storage size this much, but you have to get uh, get the file downloaded from one location to another location, 
or you need to stream it, right? So how it is happening? Because you're getting good value. So this is how the cloud computing evaluation uh, happened and then uh, which or the other services which contribute into it. So then what do you mean by cloud computing? So this is the general definition that you get. If you Google it, you just see from the National Institute uh, of Standards and Technologies where you see cloud computing is a model for enabling global, convenient, on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources. So what I'm saying is shared pool of configurable computing resources. Again, these are config configurable, that is flexible, you can see. You can do the reconfiguration, like networks. So what when you say network, then what is that network? So I can get one, one Mbps link or the 10 Mbps link or the Gbps link or 10 Gbps link. So based on your requirement, your business use case, you can choose them, right? You can configure them. And the type servers also. What is server? Like your small server, the medium server, or the large server, high compute server. Like for a testing or the POC purpose that you may go with a small server where you do just small testing and then you close your project. Or you will show the results of the POC. Then you can go with this small type of servers. Even the production environment or the uh, high performance computing, then you'll go with high, higher configuration. What is the higher configuration in the sense? Uh, in context of servers, like virtual CPU, virtual RAM, and the virtual networks, virtual disk, right? The similar ones, virtual storage. You, you want the storage? You get it. Uh, terab terabyte, not only gigabytes, terabytes and gigabytes. And applications also, you'll get the ready-made applications like, I want Oracle server pre-configured, I want MS SQL server pre-configured, I get it. I want a message queue server. I don't know how to configure it, but I want a highly, highly available message queue service. I want a SaaS application pre-configured. That also you get. Okay. Uh, most of the services pre-configured also you get. You just use them as service. Okay. So the, that can be rapidly provisioned and released. So I want these things, all these things, computing resources, rapidly, quickly, I should get it. That I, you get. And I, when I don't want it, so because, yes, uh, let me go through the first, okay, then when you don't want it, you, uh, the services will be uh, released back, okay, then you are not using them, when you don't use them, then just you terminate them or you stop them, right? <coughs> so here, when you talk about the cloud computing, so everything is virtual, in the end user perspective, as an individual as your, as a developer, as a system in, in cloud computing. Everything is virtual configuration, virtual CPU and virtual RAM. But how you are getting virtual CPU, virtual disk, virtual RAM and everything is because of the virtualization. That I will tell you in the next slides how this happens. Okay, that anyway is sitting on top of the physical. So directly you don't access the disk. So when you talk about the cloud computing, you don't access the uh, physical storage. Like when, it, when I say, uh, my file on the Google Drive is is having like 5 MB size, okay, or at least 50 uh, 50 MB size or 5 GB size. So that is by default. I think free you will the 5 GB, right? You got the 5 GB get filled up. So can you add? So and at least you will be seeing the uh, the message from the Google or someone saying that okay, your Google Drive got filled up. It's time for you to go for the paid service. If you go for the paid service, you'll get unlimited storage. If you are using Google Drive free, right? So then uh, your jitter, your you can use maximum five GB. Now, can you add more than five GB in, you, on your own manually? Just you have to go with the plan there. You have to subscribe. You have to pay for that. You have to pay additionally. Generally, they will be putting you in a unlimited storage access, right? So what is happening here? Virtually, <coughs> so that means physically you are not accessing. If I say physical storage, that means you're accessing on your laptop, on your workstation, on your server. Right? That C drive, D drive, or the slash load or slash dev or whatever the folders that you use. Right? That is physical. That it's in your hand. You, it's in your hand, you have the control to access those devices physically. But the virtual is what? That is being given some parts virtually because they're all put them on the virtualization and the uh, flash storage you are able to take some part of the CPU, some part of the disk, some part of the RAM virtually. And you don't know in which location, it is. either you are getting the disk from the US, South or North or East 
or from the Singapore or from the Sydney, we don't know. And it, they, they disclose about this. But still, we are able to get the 5 GB size. So that's what I'm saying virtual. So we'll see how it is in the next uh, slides. So what is that? What is the capsic is? You need to rapidly provision them. You can rapidly provision them and you can release them with a minimal management effort. That means there is no much dependency on the uh, data center expertise or uh, the IT admin or the uh, storage admin here. Right? Uh, you, you, you can, uh, you need not to depend on someone else. With minimal management effort, if you know how to access the internet and, and you know few things like basic things about the disk network and the systems, then you can have all the services created on your own and you can release them when you don't want them. So like take the example of POC for a small project. So I, uh, one of the developers from your team or the, uh, or any uh, lead or someone will just create the servers, like four servers with two CPU and the 4 GB RAM each and then two GB disk and then moderate or the like uh, one GB disk network connectivity and then pre-configured apology as the top of the JBoss and pre-configured uh, database, MySQL like this. And they can configure, they can create with the minimal management effort. So here they are not talking to IT admins or system admins. If it is on-prem somewhere else in the data centers, they will talk to that data center engineers, hey, There is a question, although we do not have access to the storage provider by Google, but the data we are storing that has to be in some disk, somehow it is virtual. I still have some confusion. Yeah, this is being, this is stored on the physical disk again, but for you, the size is virtual size, right? You are getting 5 GB, so that 5 GB is, could be from one disk, out of 5 GB, you may get 2 GB from one disk and uh, another 3 GB from another disk. Virtually, that is from some other physical disk, anyway. So, that is the cache of the cloud company. So, the back end, it is, it, it is built on top of hardware, hard disk. So, disk is hard disk, server is server, physical bare metal and everything. But, virtually, you will be accessing and as these are pooled resources, like you will be taking some part of it. So, it, it may not be exactly from one system or one server or one storage. So, it may be from different uh, or multiple. That's what. Let's see. Uh, let me uh, clear your dots in the next sessions. Okay, this is about the cloud company. So these are the characteristics of the cloud company. So what is that? On-demand self-service. The self-service you can say that like the way when you install something, uh, a software or the package on Windows, it's very self. You just anyone can who can read the English and the kid also can install the package because. There is nothing like next, cancel, or apply, or close. Next, next, next. So that's the cell service. The simply, in a similar way, also you get uh, options in the cloud uh, console or the, or the cloud service providers where you can pick few of the things like uh, service, like network type of network, type of servers, type of storage, type of applications, and the type of various services. You just pick them and you'll get on demand. You want it, you get it. And you get the broad network access, the connectivity between all these devices and the services or on the high, <coughs> high throughput and the low latency networks. That's what you can achieve. And so that you can copy files and the transports and get the connect, connect, have the good connect, connectivity between your apps and the databases. Right? Where you get the low latency, then your application performance could be very good. And your end user performance, end user, end users will see the good uh, uh, performance of your uh, application or website. Right? Resource peer pooling is uh, provided by the service provider where uh, they give all these types of services. Right? So resources pooled, like CPU, you'll get number of CPUs, like number of RAM, number of networks, and number of apps. Just pick them. The way when you get in the big retail store, like uh, just simple example, like could be your uh, Walmart or anywhere, right? Uh, just you go there and then you'll see the small size uh, item and then big size and all the things are lined up, pulled up, right? Just take the shopping, uh, take the cart and the uh, trolley and just take, pick whatever the item that you want. So based on your need, you may go with the uh, bigger size of the uh, item than smaller or the like uh, the package or the package, right? 
So those are the th things that are pulled already there for you. You just pick whatever you require and just walk away, get it built. Similarly, you'll get the pool of resources there. Just take, pick them and use them. Then uh, you pay only for the services that what you pick or use. Right? The rapid elasticity. So you just started with two or three servers of the ten servers now initially because you uh, you started your business startup company or uh, you don't know uh, or you have uh, assumed that or your based on your past experience your application may require ten web servers then five app servers then uh, two database servers so generally you get the high load at the web servers right so web servers like during the campaign time during the holiday season right you may uh, get put uh, uh, load to your e-commerce website to your web servers then your web servers will get high load and then uh, you need additional capacity if the CPU of those web servers goes high then there's a chance that you your end users or the customers may see slow or the bad uh, there is a degradation in the performance of the website or your entire uh, website may go down or they may break so instead of that instead of having 10 servers you can have additional another four servers you can add another four servers right so that can be added rapidly that's called rapid elasticity that is you are growing from 10 to 14 servers rapidly quickly with the agile method that is speed with the speed of uh, with, uh, with the speed they are getting new servers added assume that your campaign has been ended for the time for the day then your business will come back to normal that is your connections your uh, clients of the connections will be low after uh, ending the campaign because they have purchased whatever they want but during the uh, season something like uh, 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 and like any festival season or anything right uh, you'll uh, after that uh, your connections will come down you'll drop the connections then you you may have to come back to the normal capacity that is 10 servers so how to remove those servers those uh, just automatically like if you put, put a method or a mechanism uh, that okay, automatically those four servers should come back to oh, the 10 so from 14 to you should come home so that is also so elasticity elasticity nothing but not only stretching then uh, come back to the normal one. so that's what you achieve rapid elasticity that's called scaling as well and major services are major services that is you use services the agenda the example is that you added four servers 10 plus 4 and for one day that means you pay more for those four servers only for a day and so that's called major services so meter building you pay only for use and then if you release them like after one day you're coming back to 10 servers nothing but you terminated or stop deleted those servers that means you're not going to pay for them because you use it only for one day right this is the characteristics of the cloud company so let us get into AWS cloud company so what do you see nowadays cloud where you see servers storage and all databases and everything now this has become the normal i think you're seeing this normal right though it is the new thing but it is becoming rapidly normal you see cloud based uh, applications and the cloud based access cloud uh, resources a lot on your mobile mobile apps laptops like ipads or in your organizations or even uh, when you take most of the e-commerce applications or food uh, uh, ordering uh, applications yes virtual for is uh, like for end users so uh, when you use consumer resources like from the cloud computing everyone uh, is the end user even a big organization or enterprise company who is using uh, resources from some cloud computing provider he is the end user for that right I think that Infosys is using AWS. For AWS, Infosys is an end user. So, uh, though they are enterprise companies, they are end users. So, as a student also, you can have your uh, resources. You can test, you can play around, you can have innovation, and then you can apply it. You can work on many projects of your organ, like of your uh, uh, for your studies, right? That you can test it on the cloud, and you can show that as a project. You can submit that, right? 
even any small startup companies or uh, the middle level companies or enterprise companies can get into the cloud company. So there is a reason you are seeing everywhere cloud is, has become the normal. You see cloud based applications, like cloud based uh, resources a lot. Right? So what does cloud company mean to you? <clears throat> It's on demand, IT resources, accessible on them, the as you go. What does it mean? So, so cloud computing, what is cloud computing is? So you access you uh, on all IT resources on demand, accessible online as a pay pay as you go model. Just hold on for a second. So please let me know if you guys have any questions here. Please let me know. Back. Okay. <clears throat> what is cloud computing? Cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources. On-demand delivery of IT resources and applications via the internet. That means you are accessing using internet, accessible online with pay-as-you-go model. This is nothing but cloud computing. So you don't see this characteristic mostly uh, with the uh, on-prem of the data center or the virtualization technologies. Cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources. What are the IT resources? That could be uh, your applications or the services or you name any IT resources. Like your disk, RAM or the uh, instance or the uh, disk or the network or any pre-configured app. Right? So these IT resources and applications are access, how you access, how you're accessing them. You are accessing the own internet. And what are the resources that you are accessing on the internet for, for a moment or uh, for a time being, then you pay only for it. So, it pay, pay as you go as you want. So, how it, give, uh, it, uh, it uh, uh, gives the uh, or it uh, addresses the uh, issues with the traditional company model? Okay, it's because it's low cost, elastic. That means you can start with the low cost and uh, you can add more servers and the uh, applications and services and you can tune them and modify them when you don't want them or you want to reconfigure them, you can re reconfigure them with flexible and secure as well. So that's how uh, we, that is the, uh, that's this, if the security part is a shared responsibility model where uh, service provider will give you a lot of security options and even as a user, we have, you should consider about the security of it. That we'll see how uh, it is secure. If you compare with the uh, AWS, uh, like if you look at the AWS history, uh, they started in 2006. In 2006, they started and then they had a lot of uh, uh, services that we daily uh, don't bother about, we don't care. By 2006, they started Amazon Web Services. So they got the global reach. Uh, they are everywhere in most of the countries. And then most of the uh, uh, startup companies or the enterprise companies are also there. Okay. Uh, even the public sector companies like NASA and most of the organizations are there. Okay. So if you compare the AWS with on-premise. So, what do you see the difference? 
that would be the large initial purchase and capital expenditure, right? All this low balance source, and then uh, you have to depend on the uh, uh, the internet service providers in the power supply and all, right? So you have to do the large initial purchases, this capital expenditure and depend on the labor and the upgrade cycles, system administration, then still you have the fixed capacity. That means you you have purchased 50 servers a year and then uh, two load balancers, two switches, two routers for the high availability and the redundancy, right? And uh, you had uh, two sand devices and all. Now all of a sudden, uh, in, or in, in a uh, month of time, your business is doing, doing good, right? Or oh, you need additional capacity. So is that that simple to add few more servers, like you want to go with another 10 servers? So you have to depend on a lot of, you have to wait for a lot of uh, approval processes. You have to send a request, you have to uh, give the explanation to the finance team and your, uh, the senior management. And you have to give the, uh, give the reasons of what computation you need, what type of model you want, whether it's Dell or HP or whether we should go with this configuration, this much CPU and this much tab, and these many servers and all. Okay, all those things you have to give the uh, responsible uh, re uh, reasons. Then only you are going to get it. So it takes a lot of time. It could be days and the weeks sometimes. Again, right? The fixed capacity still there. Now 50. Adding 10 servers is not that simple. Okay, and procurement and setup. You have to do the initial configuration, you have to purchase and again the finance team will look for the budget and all. Okay. That approvals will be there anyway. And limited geographic region, that means if you have launch, if you have set up the data center somewhere in the Singapore, right? And uh, you want to start the business in Sydney or somewhere in the uh, Philippines, right? So that means your servers are there in Singapore. But uh, to start your business in Philippines or somewhere or in Malaysia. You have to set up the data center there. And again, you have to stop your servers and applications and do all these initial configurations. But if you look at the AWS and the cloud computing, no upfront investments. So you don't invest anything. You just start your services, you pay after a month. Here, though you purchase and though you don't use it or not, that means you, you did a lot of investment already. If it is being used or setting ideal, still you invested a lot but in AWS if this is a pay as you go model right if you use it you pay for it and if you start with the small and uh, you pay only after a month at the end of the month you're not paying upfront and using the service right and the low ongoing cost but this you start with two servers ten servers and then you add more increase and then when you don't need them you decrease them Right, so there is a lot of ongoing cost and focus on innovation. We take the example of a uh, few companies, few organizations like uh, uh, food retail, retail uh, chain companies or food audit companies. Like one of them is Food Panda or the Speak or something, right? Or uh, you take example of any uh, uh, real estate companies. Okay. They have to think about the innovation a lot or take a simple example of Uber. Right? Uh, they have to look for the innovations like so just to, today we have to uh, get off Uber okay and uh, you have you have not used Uber uh, for a month time like from last month one month you are not using Uber did, did you see uh, messages or the follow-up messages coming uh, from Uber saying that okay so here I'm not about not here to uh, promote or respond uh, any company just simply I'm giving the example of uh, the uh, uh, organizations how Currently, they are using right. So this time, this could be an uh, innovation in the uh, digital marketing. But how they are doing? So they are focusing on the digital marketing, and they are trying to improve sales and try to get a uh, lot of uh, uh, business and then grow commercially, right? So instead of uh, focusing on that servers implementations and the DB teams and the network teams and system teams and all, so right, uh, or people management a lot. They have to innovate, they have to think in the innovation, right? How to attract this customer since one month is not using the Uber. So let us give him a coupon code. Okay, hey, come back, we'll give you 30% discount. 
Okay, use this code today or by uh, 12 uh, or midnight 12. Right, the food coupon. Okay, use this coupon here in this uh, hotel or the restaurant or use it by this or uh, buy one get one free. So that's how they they think innovative. Right. So actually, their business, their uh, model is to sell uh, the food products and Uber travels and all, but not to focus on the system administration, system administration and upgrades and such. So if someone is there to take about all these things, like the AWS or any cloud provider, then they can focus on this. Right? The flexible capacity. So servers are automatically being added and services are being automatically removed or something flexibility and speed and with the speed and agility you want it you get it like the example I have said Black Friday and right? Black Friday you get a lot of uh, orders of the uh, customers like uh, looking for the campaigns and then uh, cheapest solution then you'll get uh, uh, you, you, if you give the coupon code to use on only on that Black Friday then so you'll see a lot of connections a lot of people waiting to use it right so for those many hours, people, uh, your website or your e-commerce website, your application, will get a lot of connections in the nodes. That means your servers are under high utilization. Right? So CPU usage and the RAM usage and the uh, connections to your services are too much and too they are high. So you need to have the additional capacity that is overnight automatically. Then how it can happen? The cloud service provider or with the options and the features provided by them will take care of it. If this is a data center, then you have to run to the data center, you have to rush to the data center, and then before to that you have to plan and procure the servers and add them. And so you the configuration. Pardon? Uh, I've got a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So for on premise, so we yeah usually set up the data center locally so in AWS yeah. you, you need to say it's been set up virtually somewhere in any geographical region yes as a part of yeah. I mean uh, yeah so uh, suppose like the traffic is very high in AWS, I mean uh, in AWS customers are purchasing the AWS storage and all and the storage capacity goes beyond the limit whatever they are expecting or whatever their capacity is so it again will hamper the customers, right? Or how it is? So the background servers are being then uh, data centers being managed by this, right? So these are being virtually managed by uh, uh, by the virtualization technologies, right? They might be using the, one of the examples they are using. Sites. On top of it, they have the uh, cloud computing layer. Or cloud public software or interface layer. So, uh, uh, so the thing is, just closing this virt virtually, you say, okay, I want one TV storage, but the physically it is being managed at the data center at the at the end. Uh, is it clear or like, uh, are we still looking for some answer from you? Is it clear? Actually, I am hearing something else from the background, so I, I can concentrate what you say. Uh, just hold on for a moment. Yes, yeah, sure.
like uh, yes yes uh, so you you said like uh, oh, can can you please uh, 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 come again you can you please come again yeah. what is the question? question yeah yeah please, please, please. yeah my question was like uh, if we set up a uh, local data center on premise yeah so we will your, have your company to wants to have the data center yeah they have set yeah. up the local data center local data center so we have limited storage and limited space and everything is limited here so in AWS you say it like we can go as we want so if if after certain years like the traffic is huge the customers demand is very high in AWS and they must be having some data centers situated in their place Amazon so if if it's uh, after certain years the if the customer demand is high and their storage uh, it's become limited so will that affect our, affect the existing customer how it will be like yeah so as they are the data centers like the way like uh, when you uh, think about the internet services right so they have a the lot of capacity they implement they add keep on add servers they keep on add storages they keep on add uh, the data centers high storage like they, they predict all these things they do the monitorings and then uh, uh, they know how many customers they have and then they have the additional capacity they have the uh, extra uh, data centers in the servers and all so that's, that, that's how they take care so similarly if you take you just talk about um, think about the uh, internet service providers you want this much bandwidth you get it so they manage from here and there the similarly uh, the amount you want to draw from your IT machine or from the bank, right? So you uh, they manage because they know uh, the need of the customers, and then they'll have the extra capacity. That is the reason they are into this business. It's their business. It's their business model. They predict and they think that okay, we may get this much capacity, this much of uh, these many uh, connections or these many requests, and users may request for more storage and more servers, right? Then According to that, they plan and they have the extra capacity those many servers. So there is no question of having uh, the AWS going with the uh, uh, the limited capacity or that capacity may get uh, uh, exhausted or filled, and then they'll, then they may run out of capacity or they may uh, get into issues. That's, that uh, that issue will not be there. It's that business because they are into that type of model, right? So they have to manage. They'll do that. Okay, thanks. I got it. Uh, I have one more question. Question: Like Google is uh, providing us five GB by default, five GB of store memory by default. Uh, suppose I have used one GB of of the storage, and rest of the GB is just uh, on hold. It's not okay. been used by. Anyone. So yeah. there might be millions and millions user whose storage is unused like me so yeah. what happens to those storage and uh, how it is managed is it a waste or it has been utilized somewhere it is being utilized somewhere. so that's how the business model is so, uh, so it is automatically so your storage is getting scaled right your limit is the quota is the 5 GP but the moment now at the current moment you're using only 1 GP and like this like you there are millions of users who are who have not used 5GB uh, fully, but uh, how from where you are getting the storage? Well, uh, uh, another 4GB or 5GB from the storage, right? So ultimately, the storage is free. That means storage is having a lot of disk storage. Your storage. So now it can accommodate, it can give this like 1GB or the 2GB and like that to another million millions of users. That's how logically the business they think. Okay, uh, though we give the 5GB, but everyone will not use the 5GB. There is a lot of free space available. We can give it to other customers. And they do have the monitoring system where they, they look for the storage and then uh, uh, the capacity and then how much it may, we need to have the, uh, the ideal or the uh, extra free space so that some of the servers, a few of the users may add uh, the data overnight or sometimes suddenly they may add or upload files. 
Okay. For that, they should have, they'll be having some data or some storage space. Okay. Did you understand? Uh, yes, I did. Got it. Yeah. So the another thing is global reach on demand. So you can you can launch your servers. You uh, have your applications running in uh, Singapore today, and uh, like or from past five years, and your business model got succeeded, and you got a good name. Your business got a good name in the industry in Singapore, and you want to launch servers in uh, Malaysia. Similarly, you want to start your business in Malaysia, but uh, due to country regulations and rules, you have to launch your servers there instead and right? not in Singapore or because the customers will see some latency right so you have to launch similar servers uh, in Malaysia so doing it like if it is on-prem you have to travel you have to fly over there and then you have to sign up the agreement and you have to talk to some local uh, 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 citizen there and then you know, uh, set up uh, your data center if it is in AWS just sitting in Singapore or sitting in US somewhere, you globally you can connect uh, the regions all over from AWS and launch your servers. So that's how simple. Just you can go globally in minutes. You can launch your server sitting in Singapore in Malaysia. Just with a simple browser and the uh, login details of the cloud service providers. Okay. This is a simple comparison between ARM, uh, AWS and ARM. If you see the cost, AWS is stack just with dollar zero. But if it is on-premise, we have to take care of all these things, physical servers, procurement, and digital setup, digital configuration, then power supplies, networking racks, all these things. So this is how it is called capital expenditure, and AWS Cloud is operational expenditure. You operate and you pay for it. You pay as a good model. You pay after a month. In your billing cycle, you pay next month. But you just start using the service. That means you're not going to pay. You start with dollar zero now. So this gives you more innovation. Right? You can experiment more often because it's a low cost. In the on-premise, you have to invest your procure servers and do the configurations. Then if that fails, your testing and your project fails, then it could be very expensive because you invested already a lot. Then, because of these constraints, when you fear constraints, right, then you go with less innovation. You test, like, you don't test frequently, experiment frequently. That means there is a less chance of having innovation, ideas, idea implementations. Because you fear constraints, you fear uh, failures, you fear costs. Whereas in the cloud, you just add servers, rip servers, delete servers, and test it. If that succeeded, then you terminate it. If that fails, then it's very low cost. Very quickly at low cost. Because you start with one or two servers. Instead of going testing with the ten servers, you just test with the smaller configuration the two servers and you pay only for it. If that fails, okay. Okay, this model is not going to work for us. Then just close it. That means you are going to pay only for the two servers. But if it's on prem you have to purchase everything, right? So there is a more chance of innovation in the past of uh, cloud computing. So, so AWS, if you talk about uh, security, every layer, at every layer, they implement security. At the global regions, at all regions, at all data centers, they have security implemented. At all computing, like firewall security, server security, firewall security. You store something in the disk, on the storage, then data encryption, the decryption. Right? You can have your multi-factor applications, strong passwords, strong accounts, and with the policies defined. Right? At every layer, AWS provides this technology. They implemented in every layer of architecture. And they have a lot of certifications to prove. What is that? So many certifications. If you're a healthcare organization, you want to get into the cloud, HIPAA complaints, AWS in particular. They show you the certification. Okay, you want to get into the e-commerce, like you want to store uh, the uh, paid information, the database and all. 
but you should be please someone uh, the data center should be please complain that means your data is is a complaint the certificate they have for have like ISO certain certifications not me so there is a shared responsibility right AWS will manage global infrastructure like regions and availability zones, applications in the compute, storage, database in the portal and all. This is a responsibility of AWS. They will take care of it. Fiscal responsibility. So when you put your data on as a customer, it's your responsibility to take care of your platform, applications, identity and access management, user accounts, passwords, time password policies and all, and network and firewall configurations it's your, it's, and data server side encryption like encryption decryption of file system the data network and traffic protections protect from the DDoS right we maintain the uh, cert, uh, certificates like SSL certificates and access when you access the, over the internet use HTTPS okay all these methods you should take care being a customer because it's your own data it's your data customer data and AWS will take care of these things, the compute, physical security, and security camera, and then uh, data center engineers, uh, multi-factor applications. Okay. So what are the benefits you get? Well, the cloud is flexible, secure, centrally managed, no need to purchase or upfront, just pay only for what the services that we use. So, in that case, you can more focus on business and innovation instead of IT. Okay. So, what are the AWS infrastructures AWS is providing? What is AWS? Is a public cloud provider where uh, everyone can individuals and organizations can use. So, what AWS is providing? It enables businesses and developers to use web services to build scalable, sophisticated, highly audible applications. So, these are the few things like compute, commonly messaging, database, and Content delivery, and uh, few analytics, and the important things. Mobile analytics as well. There are so many services. Just uh, let me walk you through. Please stop me uh, if, you, if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, trade capital expense for variable expense. That's one. So instead of purchasing upfront, you start with few servers and increase. That means your expenses will increase slowly. Okay. Comparing to uh, on-prem or traditional infrastructure. So you benefit from massive economies of scale, right? You started with five servers now, and uh, in big days of the tender within all the month time, your business or e-commerce or application is being uh, utilized or used by multiple customers. That means they are real customers, right? So they are purchasing something. That means you are you are making money out of it because when uh, there are a lot of connections or a lot of purchases from your website, then Obviously, you look for additional capacity of servers to add it. So if you started with five servers, you can add another three servers to accommodate connections and then uh, the services to end users or your clients. Right? So when you add another three servers, that means you got more number of connections and more users. That means when you are doing more business, that means you are getting uh, you are earning a lot. Right? So that's the Thing, benefit from mass with economies of scale. You are scaling your infrastructure and you are getting benefit out. That is what are the benefits? Not only uh, increase in the uh, revenue and increase in the performance of your application or website. Alright? So stop using the capacity. Don't get yes, just start with few servers. Because scaling will take care automatically. Auto scaling will happen. And it will stretch, add number of servers and it will remove number of servers when uh, your application is not in load or not required by your infrastructure. So, in order to guess uh, the capacity, you start with it automatically, blindly start with it. So, if this on-prem uh, data center, then your architect has to give the explanation before procuring new servers, saying that, okay, uh, we need uh, extra four, four servers of the three servers. Then someone may ask, okay, what if you don't use out of three, if you use only one, or what if you don't get the load, or what if our business comes back to normal load, what about those servers, capacitor? 
That means you have to do a proper planning, cost analysis, and then uh, the load analysis, and all the things, right? So you have to guess a lot. You have to plan a lot for this. What is the cloud computing? What is AWS? You don't just start with the minimal, and auto scaling will take care of it all. Well, that's how you add servers with the speed and agility, and you anyway you stop spending money on uh, maintaining data centers because this part is taken care by AWS, not as end user. As end user, you take benefits of it. As end user, nothing but you as individual or as enterprise or the stack. Now. So you can go global in minutes. You can launch your servers or your applications in your website in any geographical location. That is, you can start in Sydney, you can start in Malaysia or Singapore or in US East or West, okay, or in North America. Anywhere. So what are the core infrastructure services? You talk, when you talk about traditional and the uh, comparing with the cloud computing, you see servers, right? You see servers, plate servers, or the rack servers, or tower servers, right? In cloud computing, it's called a EC2 servers. So how do you make, uh, how do you run the servers? By loading operating system and the applications, is it? Either using, uh, by mounting ISO or the DVDs or using the kickstart methods or the images. You make use of it. You start the servers. You call on them and you boot them and you start using them. So how do you run the ECD servers? By taking AMIs, by using AMIs. AMI is the image. AMI. You use them, AMI. So AMI will have the base operating system. Yeah. Using that, you launch a server. Okay? And then uh, you have the storage and the databases. So when you talk about the storage, that is called direct data storage, it is called as HTML storage on the uh, AWS side. The local storage is called, called as HTML storage, or the local store. And the SAN disk, the SAN volume, is called as EBS volume at AWS side. Elastic block storage. So NAS, like in traditional use NAS, is called as EFS or S3. S3 is nothing but your Google Drive or the web drive. That we use S3. Then RDBMS solutions is called as RDS. So there is a replacement uh, if you want to have RDBMS solutions in cloud, AWS is called relational database service. It is a managed service from AWS. So we not to depend on the DBA a lot. So well because it creates primary databases and standby databases, it does the failover when if when the primary database goes down, it has the uh, automatic failover. That means you will get high dependency in the cloud. Okay? Networking, when you talk about networking, then you have the routers and the load balances, right? Here in AWS it is called as ELB, elastic load balancer, where it is with the load. And you have this Subnet mass, subnets, and the uh, pipelines and the switches on the router side it is called as VPC. Where you can have a custom switching and custom routing, custom uh, subnetting option. VPC. Where I can have one environment for the development, development and another environment, another networking environment for production environment. Another environment for the so or just staging. Yeah. I have one more question for you. Uh, so for our servers, I mean, we, we use cluster technology for failover and fillback. So if one data set goes down, so it will be filled over the data set. Is it in database? Is it in database? Is it uh, for database or application? Server level. Application. Uh, server level, I'm saying. So application level, if any server goes down, so it will be filled over to the other clustered server. Cluster server. So in this case, if I have a server uh, in Amazon, so what would be the chances like uh, my server will ne get never crashed? Or we need to have the same cluster technology applied over there as well? So uh, how, uh, how did you implement it? Generally, when you implement the cluster uh, technology, right, your high performance computing. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that that's, yes, that's yes. your computer uh, application. Uh, yeah, application, application, right? yeah, application level. 
data. So uh, when you use the cluster high performance compute uh, technology in Hedge uh, Mountain, that similar tech, similarly you cannot implement in the cloud. Why? Because it works on a multicasting, right? It works in a multicasting, right? Your uh, clustering uh, scenario works in a multicasting. It does the multicasting. The multicasting is not available in AWS. It, it won't allow the multicasting. It does only unicasting, but not it won't allow multicasting. But because it is shared tenancy. Like you, other organizations are also using the same networking with the same data center. Right? So then you when you do the multicasting, that means you are making a noise. So you're fast broadcasting and all. That means you will disturb other network, other network. That's the reason AWS says they fix to multicasting. If you want, want to have a separate clustering, you want to implement, there is something called parameter groups. Parameter groups where you can have a uh, group of servers and uh, increment, increments similarly and your network will be isolated. There you can configure your uh, traditional uh, application field uh, or all this clustering. Yeah. Okay, so if I don't want to go for that and uh, I am getting some background noise. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, what what is the chances like my server will never go down and my application will never go? I mean, never go wrong. It will never crash. Like if you okay. don't have the cluster technology here, so yeah. if there might be some chance like no, the server crashes and my applications goes down and it will affect my business. Right. So that's a good question. So this is the architectural decision that matters. So uh, you're looking for the single point of failure or or in single point of failure. Right. Like so if you have only one server, that means there is a single point of failure. So for the mm -hmm. high availability and the redundancy, you have to configure in such a way that there should be another server for the fault tolerance of the high availability. Exactly. That configuration that you have to create. Yeah, that is the architecture lesson that you have to change. Not the really this. So what it is is issuer data says that issuer data will give you a lot of options to choose to pick from. You use them. And then you will get the high availability. And you do the synchronization of the configuration. If you are managing servers like the way I said ECP is kind of the server, right? And it's not it's being managed by you. So you are installing the operating system inside and you are installing custom application on your own and doing the configuration. That means it's your application and it's your configuration. So no way AWS is responsible or concerned about the data inside it and the configuration that what you have done. And now you have to look for the high availability of it, redundancy of it. You have to configure it similarly. So there are options called so you can you can configure like in what scenarios your server may go down. Right? Assume that your server is in one data center or in one rack or one room. So enter your entire data center may go down. If you have one set. So for that high availability, what do you do? You keep another server in another data center. Right? Yeah. So that's what AWS says that okay, we are having another option called something called availability zone. You keep right, come again. that is called availability zone. That that I'm coming. Alright. You launch your server in another availability zone. That entire server until data center goes down, but still your business will be running with another server, which is in another data center. And how you can launch a new server based on the backup that you have taken. There's something called snapshots. Right? Point in time uh, data. Right? That using that you can quickly provision a new server. That option AWS is providing you. So you should, to use all those things, you should be familiar with the technologies and the services And how uh, these things can be automated. If something goes wrong with my server, one of these servers then how quickly or or how uh, with the minimal downtime I can launch a new server. So for that what is the service to you and how I can use it, how can I use it. What are the other high level options provided by the world? That means 
Okay, but application level, that's your responsibility to take care of it. A few of the things is the background, the data center level and the uh, AWS managed services is there. When it's said about RDS, right? So this is the additional database service, it's a managed service. So here the database whole thing is being taken care of by AWS. Just you are accessing the database as the end user or as the developer or as the client. But instead you are not getting into the database of the server and you are not doing any configuration of uh, your database or optimizing it or you will not have you not have the uh, file level access to the database. Then you, when you use the service RDS. This fully managed database service. They only AWS DBS will have the access to it. And they will give the highly available high availability of your database. They will create master and the standard it is. And if they you can if you choose the option to have the read replicas, you will have the read replicas as well. If primary database goes down, still uh, that means at the time automatically they will be straight over done to the standby. The standard standby will be promoted as a, a master. Again from the master, a snapshot will be taken and another standby will be created. What who knows in another next minute, in another 10 minutes or 5 minutes, the standby DB which got promoted as a primary also may get dashed or that something may happen or uh, any magic committee of this stuff may happen. Uh, in that area or in that area. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So these are the various services provided by this. If it is easy to you have to take care as your own as you do on the data center. If it is easy to. But still few of the most of the options are there. From the EC2 custom AMI also you can take. That's nothing but the whole copy of your server. From the same server again from the copy you can launch a new server. Quickly. But you see small downtime, but instead of uh, uh, like instead of uh, having nothing, you'll have something. At least quickly you can close in yourself. In this case. Okay. So there's something like uh, networking. Then security when you talk about security, like traditionally call it a firewall, right? Ports, firewall, allow inbound access to my environment from the external, right? When do you use firewalls? to block or act to allow or deny external access to my internal network or internal resources. This firewall is for external access. That's called security group in AWS. And ACLs is called network access control list where you deny or allow internal subnets or internal uh, people or internal uh, uh, members of your organization. That is network access. Okay. And we create read only access and full privilege users, right? Read only users and partial privilege users, usernames and groups in traditional technologies. It is called the AWS sign. These are the core infrastructure services uh, and the comparison between traditional and the uh, on-prem. Right. Do you guys have any questions here? Please let me know. So this is the small uh, the comparison between traditional components and uh, Amazon AWS components. So there are a lot many. But these are the common things that you use, right? As a uh, uh, startup or even enterprise companies, these are the common building uh, components uh, for your infrastructure, or to host any website or app or any application or the database or anything, right? These are the common things that you use. So there are so many uh, hundreds of services, other or even that uh, you may use or may not use, like uh, analytics, data warehousing and then uh, streaming, video streaming, chain codings and all. You may use or may not use, but they are the common things that you use. That's what we have seen earlier. There are more than 2500 services for data variables, right? import export and the quick inside, DynamoDB, AppStream, Redshift, Cloud Search, Workspaces, Inspector, RDS, Lambda, MariaDB, 
cloud trail we'll see what what we are so there are so many services uh for the way this is just a small glimpse of the management console from where you get your server to manage accounts and all okay so when you look at the console these services are grouped like ec2 is for the compute container services like platform service s3 storage okay and the uh, in the database you see different database services and then what you see with pc the dns uh, also the jobs of the developer you use for the way the way you use git right the cloud version modern identity access management for users in the group tools for for your big data hadi applications many services you know you not to configure your entire hadi uh, environment big data you just need the mr and the other and this all the things are configured for you in the background all the services the booking and the gps and all the things are configured for you okay or no matter i will be and the mobile services Hmm? Notification services. Notification services. No. Email services. Human being services. Human services. Ordered by AWS. So one of them is the cloud formation, where you create and manage resources with templates. So everything, whatever you are creating manually using the console, all these things like DMS, RDS, S3, uh, servers, and the networking and all. you can just put them in a script in a template and just execute the scripts the way you uh, put all the commands in the shell script next to the script right or the bash script or the python script okay those things will get executed and you will see all the result right but if you say mkd or some particular directory and then copy some file from remote location and to that directory right in a shell script and you execute it the task will uh, be taken care and you see the file is uh, the directory is created and file is uh, downloaded from the remote location from the pc and uh, copied uh, or saved to the server and similarly cloud uh, formation is the one where you do the infrastructure so you can use the cloud okay that's what you see uh, the global infrastructure from every place to take over talk about the aws infrastructure there is the details or you will see zones and locations then all the operation services like compute storage database and booking in compute you see servers called ec2 like can do some services as well right so storage you see s3 is something called s3 which kind of web drive or the google drive that we use and ebs is the sand disk we we'll get the sand then and uh, rds is the recent database service where uh, most of the uh, database uh, management and activities are taken care by aws it just as end user as a developer you just access to this as a, uh, access to storage or the database I uh, just you just pass the uh, DNS name of the server and then uh, uh, database name, username, and password. The way traditionally uh, using the uh, database bank, you access the database right? in that way. So everything is taken care by AWS as a full DB uh, admin uh, uh, from AWS. Like that sample DB, Elastic Cache. Elastic Cache is something like your in-memory cache. The way you use memcache and the database, right? So it is being taken. Here by uh, AWS in the form of clusters. They keep on add clusters and give the lot of memory uh, memcache op options for you. The DynamoDB and the networking is kind of VPC and the load balancer. We get less load balancer and most of the names that you here see here are the Elastic or something. Auto Auto and Elastic Auto Scale and Elastic. Direct Connect and the Route 53. Route 53 is the data service from uh, AWS. the direct connectivity is something like the name itself so direct connectivity from your data center or your office uh, to the cloud the way you have the vpn connectivity right or the vpn 
private lease land connectivity. So direct connectivity to private lease land connectivity is from your office of the data center to the AWS. So that you can uh, securely transfer files or securely connect from your uh, office the way you connect using the way you connect uh, using VPN, site to site VPN, but you access those resources in remote location or the private IP addresses, right? Similarly, like you feel that, okay, the service is locally in my data or in my office. Directly is one of the solutions like that. And then uh, application services are also platform services like content distribution, like CDN or caching, edge caching, the, the, uh, the solution like Akamai, one of them, right? Cloudflare and Akamai, where they do the content distribution and the content caching. Messaging, like notification services, queuing services, MQ service, like ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ, Kafka, like there are so many, right? Uh, kind of queuing services, MQ message queuing service is SQS, email service. For big data the application environment, you want to set up everything, you stop that, you just use the EMR from AWS, then your environment is automatically taken care of AWS. Just the small tweaks and the configurations and optimizations, you start using, uh, you implement analytics and the reportings or ad hoc or the streaming uh, analytics uh, from the uh, AWS. If you are a developer, simply you can download SDKs and the libraries uh, for any environment like Java, PHP, Python, Ruby, .NET, Node.js. Right? Most of the uh, libraries and SDKs are available, you just use them download them and add it to your uh, developer environment or your application and uh, call that call these services like compute, storage, database, uh, network services, queuing services, all these services using the SDK. Instead of accessing using console, you manage or uh, using the code. Like you can, you can embed them in your Java code, you can embed them in the PHP code. These SDKs in the libraries, the way you call environment variables. Right? to call those libraries as a developer. And administration tools, management administration tools that you can use, uh, you can monitor these servers like your CPU usage of servers and the network throughput and how much you're writing and how much you're reading from the disk and how much uh, data being transferred from the network from one server to another server and how many connections I'm getting to the load balancer and uh, how much uh, database is being utilized and how many Sessions, I'm getting concurrent sessions to my database. All those things uh, can be monitored uh, from the cloud There's kind of monitoring code that we uh, use Nagios or Oxy or Zabbix or Zenius or something like that. Any monitoring code. Similarly, the cloud watch is a monitoring code from the database. Okay. And web console you get, obviously, the way I assumed earlier, web console. And uh, I am that is nothing but identity and access management where you can create users and groups, policies, roles. You can give the different policies and the roles to uh, users and the groups. And you can have the identity federation out there. That is the way uh, nowadays you see like you try to access one website, but uh, you need not to be a uh, registered user. I think uh, you have to log in, you have to register and log in to the website or else if you have the account in Facebook or LinkedIn, from there also you can, uh, like if you uh, log in using the uh, Facebook or uh, any social media website, uh, from there uh, you can, uh, if you successfully connect there, it will take you to that website. So that's kind of federation you can have. Uh, so not only with social media sites, you can have the federation between your active territory of your organization. Right? Uh, like if you log into your uh, workstation, or active using active directory or your office account, you will be able to access other resources on the cloud app if, you, if there is a federation uh, given between these two. Okay. And then uh, you have the de deployment and automation kind of DevOps and the automation things like Elastic Beanstack, Cloud Formation as I said earlier, infrastructure as code. You put everything in a script, in a template and just export the script and everything will be configured for you. Uh, in the background. So, because uh, uh, the, how it is helpful is you can reuse the script. But initially now if I uh, configure a developer environment with few servers, a uh, few ECT servers, few database RDS and some EBS volumes, right? S3 
and few mail services and one of the uh, VPC and the DynamoDB something. If you configure that, uh, they develop an environment using the cloud formation script. And uh, tomorrow I want to replicate the similar configuration for the uh, staging environment. Just, just, re just give the label as the uh, staging environment and reuse the script and uh, reapply the script. You will get similar configuration, similar stack built, similar servers built with just different labeling. Right? This is how simple. So you can avoid human errors there and then you'll have the clear visibility and you can uh, give it to your senior management or someone else for their code. So then you can have your uh, applications, uh, custom applications on top of that. Okay. Yeah. That's how, uh, as I said earlier, you have the uh, AWS infrastructure regions, solubility zones in applications. This is what? Where? Yeah, in India. Yeah, like in US, South, US, and then Sydney, then uh, Europe, right? China, yeah. So what you see uh, inside, so the, the circle that what you see is the region, and inside the number is the availability zone. So we we'll see what is availability zone, okay? And there are government cloud as well. So numbers you already have seen, right? Minimum you see two, that is minimum two or more than two. Two, few of them are three, and few of them are four and five, right? New regions also coming, like tags in the uh, names, yeah? That's you see. So what is region? As we as see this, like these are all the regions, right? So region is nothing but a geographical location. A region is a collection of two or more already zones in a specific geographic area. So if I talk about the region here, right? Sydney is the region in Australia. What is the Sydney? Is the region nothing but is having two or more already zones. How many availability zones is having? Now the number says three. Right? What is availability zone? We'll see that later. But that is the Sydney is the geographic location representing Australia. Choose your region in which your data will be stored. Why you use region to store your data, to launch your servers, launch your applications in the databases. Right? And it is independent from each other, obviously. The Sydney region is independent from other region. Right? This is Singapore. So it is independent from the region Singapore, obviously, right? It's far away location. So what region is having two or more all-in-one designs? So this could be one region, another region, another region from uh, distant geographical uh, locations. So why do you choose regions is to optimize latency. As I said, your business got succeeded in Singapore and uh, you want to launch similar service, similar server, similar application, website, and uh, another country, the city. Right? So look at this. In Singapore, you launch servers, but tomorrow, like after, like, uh, you want to launch your similar website in Sydney, but the users, like, if you don't do this, like from uh, Sydney, they try to access the servers in the uh, Singapore, they'll see a lot of latency because it's going over the internet and VC and all that, right? or the satellite and all. So it takes a lot of time or there will be a uh, performance decreasing. If you launch the servers, similar server here in Sydney, your local users will be accessing locally. Then there will be low latency and good uh, performance of the application. There is a reason you go with regions separately. So to optimize latency, to minimize cost, why because the different countries have the different regulations and generally in US we see uh, uh, point service, right? So you can launch servers, if you launch servers in, uh, two servers in uh, US uh, Central and two servers in Singapore, those uh, servers in uh, US Central are very cheaper than, uh, pretty cheaper than this Singapore because most of the things that you get very cheap as a, uh, uh, in US. So, Region to region cost changes will be there, cost mean uh, uh, cost difference will be there, and regulatory requirement for the regulatory requirements as well. So uh, the countries, few of the like generally you'll see this in Europe, 
uh, in Europe, most of the states or the countries, uh, they have a lot of regulations. If you want to run the business, your servers and the apps and the data should be in the same country, not in another country. If you are the citizen of other country, they want to do the business or if you are having the personal information of the customers, you have to keep their on you, not from other locations. For that purpose also you'll go with the regions. So, so these are completely separate and uh, when you're transferring the data from Singapore to Sydney or from one region to another region, you have to look for the data encryption but uh, might be in some real time so they may have the separate connectivity from one region to another region the way other service providers are also giving like Azure and the cloud. What they are doing is like they have the separate lease and separate connectivity from one region to another region. Dot when you do the data transfer from one region to another region, like serve one server to another server in different regions, so the data will be transferred in a private channel. It is separate, uh, uh, that is what uh, the dire local connection. If it is AWS, you have to take care of it at the moment. Maybe in another few months, they may add it, or they may uh, give the separate connectivity, private connectivity from one region to another region. Okay. So then what is Albedi Zone? Albedi Zone is the isolated collection of AWS resources. Really has seen that. You said that you have two or more Albedi Zone. It's called Albedi Zone A, AZA, AZB, like that. Or these are isolated collections, like this is the data center, another data center, another data center. But these are interconnected with the high throughput and low latency connections, dot fiber connections. So redundancy. If, you, if one connection goes down due to some errors or failures, still you have the connectivity from another side. Okay, so these are something like form cluster, form within a region. So these are the different data, uh, data centers from different locations. So if you take in uh, somewhere in uh, yes, uh, like uh, California, in Northern California, you will get one uh, availability zone and the south of that thing will see another uh, But these are interconnected with the uh, high throughput uh, low latency networks. Okay. So collection of data centers within each region and then uh, isolated from each other zones and connected by low latency links. Okay, as I said. But, and we have protected them from failures on other regions. So if one AZ goes down, still we have another source. So someone asked me the question. For the high liberty and redundancy, uh, what should, uh, how, how should I uh, uh, take, uh, how, how should I design and how should I implement uh, if some, if one of my server goes down, if it is some uh, natural calamity or disaster or any type of failure or fire aggregate or something, uh, how should my uh, business should continue? How, how should I uh, implement business continuity and how should I achieve? Uh, high liberty of my website and the application, right? So if you have three web servers, right, or three app servers, then you launch each app server or the app web server in each other web zone. If one server goes down due to some issue, still your end users are accessing or your website is running, your application is running from another other web server, from the same region. So that is the best practice and it protects them, protects them from the failures. Okay. Handle request in case of failure, that's what I said. Okay. If you have implemented three web servers and three uh, data centers, nothing but three availability zones, it's best practice to have. Provision resources across multiple availability zones. Don't keep everything in one data center. Okay. Don't keep all services in one data center, nothing but one availability zone. So, keep, so see, my question then, was yeah. like, yeah. So my question was like, what if one goes crashed, so mm -hmm. it should be failed over to other. So will, in, in this scenario, will it get failed over automatically, like from one availability zone to other availability zone? Yeah, there are other things, like there is something that you have to integrate with the DNS. How your DNS will take. So if this, your DNS can have the uh, latency-based routing or uh, you can have the, uh, uh, geographical based logic. So okay. that is most, uh, that, that is another scenario. Uh, the thing is you can have the script, another automatic script where it can sense that okay, this, 
this IP is down. It's not reachable. That's that's what you need. You need the heartbeat, right? Heartbeat. So if this server goes down or enter data center goes down, that means this server is not reachable. But you have another servers configured, right? Or if you keep the load balancer here or the script, then that will give the DNS pointing to this IP address, this servers. It depends whether you are keeping all the servers in active active mode or active passive mode. So if it is active passive mode, then they should become active if this goes down. If it is active active mode, right? Then if this goes down, if you have the round robin fashion or something, then uh, then heartbeat will check that okay this is down, then it will mark that okay this is not a healthy host, is not reaching at the moment, then request will be routed to the another active host. That's how you take advantage of uh, taking the load balancer, where it does the health checks frequently and uh, marks that uh, unhealthy host, marks that dead host as unhealthy and it will not direct the request or it will not distribute the traffic to that server but to the healthy servers. So it's the architectural decision, uh, it depends on the architectural decision that you take. And or the script or the uh, tool that you are using in between these two. Or the logic that you are applying between you know, the active IP servers or active IP servers. So that, that should be detected. There should be mechanism to um, mark that dead host uh, in such a way that a new request should not go to that host. But new request should go to the active or the healthy host. You got my point? But AWS is giving you the availability zones in such a way that you can block servers in different availability zones. And if one data center goes on, still you'll be able to access other web servers and your website is running uh, with the two servers instead of having three. Then you can launch a new servers you can work on. Okay. okay. But there is a provision resources across one the best practice. What is advocations? Nothing but the service called CrowdFund is an advocation. It was something about a robust content delivery network, CDN. You see all the dot dot dots here, right? All this. Will be, uh, maybe uh, this time you have so many. So why do you use CDN? You host a, to host a content delivery network, right? So what do you host? Generally websites, dynamic and static content, Audio video streamings, generally the way we access YouTube, videos, right, clips and all. So these are streamed from the CDN. With the YouTube.com in the US somewhere, with a person from the Sydney is trying to access the uh, YouTube.com site uh, with a uh, clip or a video, if it's not CDN, if it's not CDN, the user will be accessing the content from the server, on the web server which is hosting that video. So yes, how it is traveling? It is traveling over the CD and all that. Right? So there will be a lot of latency. Then they will see a lot of lag or the uh, this performance uh, or the slowness or the buffering, some kind of thing, issues. If it is CDN, the copy will be stored. So whenever the user access from the CD, the user platform to the US, the copy of the video will be uh, sent to the edge location. The CDN uses the concept called edge location, nothing but the data center, where it stores that copy, where it streams the copy, and the local user from Sydney will access the content local. That's the reason nowadays you uh, watch videos in the movies, like uh, take example of Netflix, videos and all. So you are getting it from that local edge location from the local data center. The copy will be uh, stored there and you are accessing the portal. That's how it is requests are routed to the nearest location. If the customer a user from the Sydney is accessing the content of YouTube.com and then send or at the same moment or here to this the copy will be stored there and will be uh, given access to the local content. Then uh, the user assumes that okay, this is okay, this is uh, from my uh, nearest uh, location or from uh, being accessed from the local data center, also the same country. 
and you can come back and you see fast and content and all that. Uh, Sajid, can you come back again uh, this CDN yeah. part? Yeah. Never done what about Akama, right? This is the Akama. One of the companies. Top one. Uh, top uh, player as well. But then, uh, where is your question? What is the question? Do you have any question here? Uh, regarding CDN, so I didn't understand yeah. what exactly did you say? So, it, it, there will be a copy, like if, take, if you take the example of YouTube.com, YouTube.com mm -hmm. website. So, YouTube.com got a presence in the US. Okay? Then, that servers and web servers and app servers without having the videos, audio and video videos in the US, right? In US data centers, at the servers, in central US. But they, uh, but the user, someone from Sydney is trying to view the website by just by typing www.u.com and particular clip, which is on youtube.com. Right? So what happens, there will be a lot of latency and the user from Australia will see a lot of lag in the uh, video on the audio or there in a uh, few years ago, we used to see uh, the buffering, like the video is getting buffered. Right? Wait, buffering. The slow performance, and then you you cannot watch the movie in the high density. But nowadays you are watching HD content, 4K content. How is it being possible? Because if it is HD content, we access from the uh, Sydney, uh, with, uh, the content which is in US, that takes that has to be uh, streamed over the internet and then as the HD content is very huge right in the size you will see you cannot you cannot see proper pixels right you cannot you will see the lag between your audio and video synchronizations your video goes front and then your audio and the lip movement you see in the back so it's, these, are, these are not in the same proper sync or the video buffer shades and all if it is in CDN, if the CDN, if the, that YouTube.com has enabled the CDN content distribution network, that means they got the tie-up with the service providers where they send the copies of the those videos in the clips. I think that a new trailer has been released in the market. Okay, uh, that trailer copies, nothing but those clips will be stored in different different locations. In Sydney, also you have one location, right? So AWS or the YouTube.com will first copy immediately they put a copy here when a user from uh, Sydney is trying to access the site that request will be routed to the nearest Sydney location nothing but the same same thing in Australia Australia somewhere go in Sydney somewhere in Australia that is the nearest location but right? now he will be able to access the HD content over the network internet effectively and efficiently that is the advantage of having edge locations. Okay, but suppose like fast and content delivery. So suppose like one user has uploaded his or her video. Mm -hmm. You uploaded one video in YouTube. So mm -hmm. he is not sure like where it has got stored, like in US data yeah. center or whatever it is. So, so so person from suppose he has uploaded from Sydney. So person mm -hmm. from India he wants to access it so he will type it so it will get i mean buffered from i mean it will get fast from us server so for the yeah. first time it has to be fast and it will be stored in local server nearby you see what the concept is yeah so when someone from india is asking me uh, is trying to access it that's in that uh, his or her friend has uploaded a file uh, the clip from uh, Sydney to YouTube.com. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one of his friend is trying to access from India the same clip. Okay, that copy will be sent to or stored in the nearest location, nothing but the data centers. Like I that control is or could be Airtel or any data or its own AWS is also having its own data centers, right? It, uh, its regions and availability zones. They keep the copy here and they distributed locally. If someone from Chennai or Delhi trying to access the same clip, they'll be accessing that file locally from this location. That is, 
uh, from the edge location instead of accessing from the US or from Sydney. Because the copy is being sent or there is a copy maintained in the edge location. Because YouTube.com is maintaining the CD. Is is having the CDN option feature. Example, one of them. So the way you access, okay. the way you want to have the RDS uh, database solution RDS, the way you want to have the server for EC2, for the content distribution instead of going with the Akamai, uh, we can use the CD. Come it is. We got a back. It's a sol is the solution of the service from AWS for the caching and fastest content delivery. Or else you can go with that command as a third party company. They also do the similar way, same fashion. But they may not be having these many servers, these many uh, edge locations. Let me show But it has got a lot of presence in most of the countries and they got tied with the local uh, data centers of the companies of the data center companies, right? Uh, they, they may have the collocation with them. They will get some part of the storage. Then they will put a copy and the homeowner is accessing the same uh, content, they will be redirected to the nearest web location, not about that data center, they will access the content. Like right. website containers, static dynamic content quickly, that when you load a website homepage, homepage will get loaded quickly. Because those images, GF images, JPEG images, external content, right, uh, that is being served from your nearest information. Because they keep the content, the cache of it in the nearest location. But the reason you see websites being loaded faster because they are using CDNs, edge locations or something like Atama. Atama is the company where they provide this kind of services. They got tagged with a lot of data centers. You got my concept. Is it clear? Uh, yes it is. Okay. I think there are a lot many cloud company services on AWS. I think it's not that clear. We'll see that uh, security management. So many services, what we name it, like analytics and the compute, the water we are discussing earlier, right? All these things are there, like networking and CDN, databases, storage, compute, all of these zones, regions, so many like security part, platforms, development apps, okay, virtual desktop, media solutions. Okay, hybrid cloud, management tools, marketplace where you get uh, ready-made com uh, configured solutions for you and then technical support from ready -made. Okay, I think I'm done with this, with the demo. Please let me know if you guys have any questions. Uh, you guys can uh, look at the uh, post content that what we are covering. You can request for the post content. Uh, so, did how much time? A lot of the topics. Yeah. yeah. So, how much time it will take to learn complete AWS? I mean, to give you the training in complete AWS. Yeah. Uh, it is a thirty-five days uh, training. So sometimes like like uh, plus uh, one or two days uh, extra for it because we will be covering uh, a lot deep dive into uh, most of the services where uh, uh, is being customized based on the uh, projects uh, and the companies and the organizations assignments where most of the cloud engineers and architects work on the uh, services so like EC2, EBS, S3 and then deep dive into it and with the uh, real time scenarios covered and uh, uh, with best practices, cost optimizations, and uh, 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 comparison with the on-prem applications in the cloud services. So all these things, all these scenarios can be covered uh, during the training, theoretically uh, deep dive, and then practically with the practice scenarios. Even doing going while going with the theory, uh, not only we are learning the concepts, but we are comparing with the different scenarios. How the service is implemented in the real time, uh, either on the cloud or in the on-prem or the traditional technologies. And then, while doing the labs in the practice, we'll be taking the real-time project snaps. So if you look at the course content, then uh, uh, you know you'll see the difference uh, how the models are being covered. 
like deep into IEM and then deep into RDS and then uh, deep into most of the development tools, okay, the migration tools and then implementation tools like SNS, SKS, SES, uh, DMS, and then EC2, ELB, auto scaling, best practices and uh, what are the options available and what are the different uh, uh, methods and techniques uh, to be applied and troubleshooting techniques. All these things can provide you. So architectural decisions, what are the best practices, how can we convince the client and uh, what are the uh, on-prem services uh, being used by the client, then how uh, we can convince the client uh, to use the cloud services and the best uh, and better than the traditional uh, services that you are using on-prem. So all in, in applications, so we do the, uh, some kind of uh, automations using cloud formations and then uh, CLIs using CLI as is admin, how you script them, how you use them, how you call them uh, using command line tools, not only from the uh, console and how you integrate, how you pass those values to another scripts and how you implement it uh, for the monitoring purpose, custom monitoring app. Guys, any questions? I'm not looking. Okay, just I'm looking. Does AWS has their own data companies? Okay, I think it's being answered already. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Please let me know. Guys, any questions? Do you have any questions? Please let me know. Okay, guys, because we are stopping here. Okay, I think uh, no more questions are from the audience. Okay, from the participants. Okay, let me close. Okay, then. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Bye. Mm -hmm.